Welcome back to Tabletop and Beyond. This is our third vidcast of the year, and I'm I'm loving it, guys. I'm loving it. I'm loving seeing your faces. It's very engaging. Yeah, having a good time. Oh, <laughs> hi. How's it going? Dan was we, kind of frozen there for a minute. <laughs> we all need to get the big uh, condenser mics or whatever those are. That you've got in your camera there to fill up the, uh, t- you know, a third of our screen. There you go. I got mine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Oh, put it back. It's messing up with your audio. Put it back. It's messing it up. Put it back. Put it back. <laughs> well, we've got an interesting show for you today. As Dan and I were talking before the show, not often do we turn news items into full blown episodes. But with the old hubbub and hubadoo and all the bubble up that's happening with the open gaming license and Hasbro and Watsi, Wizards of the Coast and Paizo and Cobalt Press and Critical Role and you name it, everybody's got an opinion. Um, there was quite the uproar in the gaming community. We did talk about this a little bit in our last podcast, but I think that it was um, a little superficial. And so we decided that we needed to dive in a little bit more because uh, while I don't think that it totally affects us as just everyday gamers, uh, it's definitely going to make some ripples and maybe even some tsunamis in the RPG world. So we want to kind of talk about that, work through that a little bit today. And uh, yeah, but before we even get into Geek Week, I think we have a special announcement. The announcement that we have today is that we have officially rolled out our Patreon account for the Tabletop and Beyond. So we're very excited about that. And uh, what I wanted to show was this right here. So now I know that our listeners can't really see this, but it is at patreon.com slash tabletop and beyond. If you go here, we have our Patreon page there and we would really appreciate if you enjoy the podcast if you feel like you're getting benefit and value if you wouldn't mind uh, supporting us we've got some big plans for what we want to do with the show and bring extra content to uh and quality to you the listeners and to do that we kind of need a little bit more funding to up our game a little bit so uh as you can see we've got three tiers here we have a three dollar month tier six dollar month tier and ten dollar month tier um, this is to, to become a listener, a beyonder, and a far beyonder. And uh, we we feel like we are offering some pretty good stuff. Um, what do you think, Jason? I think I think so. We're going to give off some good digital rewards. Obviously, we're going to do the, the special Discord channels. We're going to get those set up here pretty soon. So you can, you can give us uh, inputs and voting on topics. Depending on the reward, you'll be able to submit topics for us. Maybe even have you on the show do some role-playing games, a lot of good stuff on there. But my, my most exciting thing that I, that I'm all super excited about is the dice, the dice oh, that yes. is, that is a gift to our, uh, beyonder and above. Uh, Actually, uh let me, sh- let me show here. that. Yeah. Again. You should bring it up. I will. Put it up on the big board and torture. So our what we see here. Oh, there it is. All right. Yeah. Oh. Like pretty yeah. nice, so, so sweet, sweet dice. Sweet, sweet dice. So if you sign up for the Beyond or Above, we'll mail you a pack of six, which is perfect for Warcry ability dice roll or priority roll. Yes. Um, it's also great for Kill Team. It's also great for any other board games that you have. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're great as kind of novelty dice if you want to use them. Like, you can use them in a lot of different things. Uh, I mean, Dan, you've got, like, basically a giant grab bag of dice at your house. I've seen it. And I do. I keep a wooden box full of rando dice that I've collected. So one of them I still play with. I've had it since the late eighties. So I've yeah. held on yeah. to one and we stole that from a risk game. I think they're uh, great dice. They roll high when you need them to and low when you don't. That's right. That's right. It's weird like that. And yeah. it mostly works for yeah. Jason that way. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> you get a lot of crits <laughs> with these dice. <laughs> yeah. So, so just for our audio listeners, these are D6s. They are kind of a, a gray and white marble. They've got red pips. And the uh, the six number is our logo or, or a version of our logo, T and B, Tabletop and Beyond. 
If you go to patreon.com slash tabletop and beyond, there is a post with a great picture that we're showing right now that you can see, as well as information on all of the great things that you can get in each of the tiers of Patreon. So we just want to encourage all of you to check it out. And again, if you feel that you would like to support the show, we would very much appreciate it because um, we... We've got plans. We've got plans for you guys, and we're we're not planning to go anywhere in terms of uh, fading off into podcast uh, no man's land. We just uh, all all's up from here. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and we got our first published RPG supplement. We do. We just put that out today, and so our Patreon members, if you are interested in a D and D fifth edition uh, <laughs> adventure, which was. <laughs> <laughs> Yell. Spoiler uh, alert! But uh, if you are interested in a D and D fifth edition uh, one shot adventure that Jason wrote, it's a really good one. He ran it at a catacon um, as a Shadow of the Demon Lord, but we ported it over to D and D fifth edition, and uh, it's going to be it, it's a great adventure to run with your friends. Takes about four hours to play, and uh, anywhere between like four to six players if you want. Um, not including the DM, so it's a pretty good adventure. And I probably should throw a picture of that up here right now, but I just don't have a prep. So that's okay. Yeah, you know, in our social media, you'll see it there. So anyway, uh, yep, that's our just initial announcement and uh, moving on. So Jason, how was your geek week? Well, I had uh, got to play some games with some some family. I had spent some time with some family this week. Uh, traveled a little bit. Uh, I played uh, Gunfights and Gambling, which is a, a favorite that we bring up a lot here, right? I mm-hmm. uh, played it with some new people who'd never played it before. And uh, as always, man, it come that game is so perfectly balanced. It comes down to, you know, every everyone feel the thieves feeling like they're getting lots of points, and the pioneers feeling like they're really struggling to keep up. And then right at the end, it know it's it's a tied game and we have to go to a, a a shootout at the end so it's it's just such a well-balanced asymmetric played game um so it's good really that hard w- to do really really hard and i remember when we first played i remember when we first sat down and played with this guy and it's this guy and his wife their company's mid-level meeple you can go to mid spill just like it sounds mid-level meeple.com a uh, guy and his wife that have published the games and they have a couple games out now um he, uh, we sat down with him at a catacon and played it with him. That's how we found it. I've uh, got the game, game right here. Um, yep, there you go, mid level meeple. And uh, we played it with him, and we had, we were like, Hey, do you want any input? And he's like, Not really. He's like, It's balanced, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> and and, well, and my, you know what? It is, yeah. <laughs> You're like, Well, my input was that I really like the shotgun shell roller, yeah. But, all right, yeah. sure, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have a, um, I got one of the pre-ordered shotgun shell rollers. It's a little dice roller, and it's a lot of fun to play. Everybody wants to play. Oh, give me the shotgun! I want to roll. And so they'll they'll drop their dice. You know, they'll drop their they'll drop their dice in it and roll it and have a good time with it. So good times. Very good times. Very good times. Awesome. Yep. Uh, S- second thing I did was I played uh, Space Base. I don't know if any of you guys have played that game before, but that is a fun game too. That's another one of those um, simultaneous play games where uh, on your turn you have you have a, a deck in front of you with the numbers one through twelve uh, cards, and those represent various ships that give you active bonuses on your turn. And on your turn, you roll two d6 dice. They could be the special edition tabletop and beyond dice. I uh, roll two d6 dice, and then based on the number that comes up, you can activate the ability on your card. So if you roll a three and a four, you can activate the ability on the three card and on the four card, or the ability on the seven card. So it runs up to 12. Um, and uh, while you're playing your active turn, the other players all have passive abilities. And depending on the dice you roll, they get to get the passive bonus from their card. So you're constantly building and buying new cards on your turn that'll make it so that you can get income and victory points when you're playing your normal turn. But then also when the other players are playing their turn, you're trying to set your deck up to get passive bonuses. So you're always playing the game, whether it's your proper turn or not. I love those kinds of play. 
Uh, really fun game. Uh, simple. It, I would say it's not ultra competitive because at the end of the day, it's, you know, you're rolling dice and you're just picking numbers. But uh, you feel like kind of like Dominion. You'll feel like you're building your deck as you go and just having a good time with it. Very good. Yep. Sounds awesome. Is that, that was, was that week. your game or your family's game? Family game, that one. Yep. And that okay. uh, that one, you know, I've seen that one at uh, convention conventions here and there. Never played it, so it was good to get that on. That's a new game. New game for oh, me. Very good. Wasn't is that part of your New Year's resolutions? New game. It was. It was last year. Yeah, new last game year. every month. But uh, no reason to stop that now. No, keep it going. Already yeah. one for one. One for one. <laughs> Dan, how was your geek week? Great, great. Um, on Saturday, we uh, did it. I ran a uh, Star Wars West Marches session here in the old basement. Mm -hmm. Had a great time. Um, they were they thought they were bounty hunting, but they didn't know they were on a haunted spaceship. So uh -oh. that's the great thing about Star Wars. It's very elastic. A lot of genres fit into Star Wars. So um, our our players that were thought they were bounty hunting ended up ghost busting, and that was just fun. Um, also, uh, my son and I I mentioned Marvel United last time we played. Um, we've played it. A bunch more time since then. He got so excited. He invited three of his buddies over to his house. One had to tap out because of COVID. Oh. So we had two kids down here today, all playing Marvel United. It's a 14 and up game. These kids are 10. They loved every second of it. We absolutely had a blast. Co-op game was fun for those guys. But little 10-year-olds always think they have the right idea. And learning to give and take is a little bit harder than maybe... It would be for for a slightly older crowd, but they they sorted it out, especially when it's one of those games where you, there's no fixed turn order. Like you can move your turn order around a little bit. Oh man, they didn't like that rule at all. They're like, it's going to be me, then you, then you. <laughs> we're, not gonna do <laughs> we're not messing around with turn order. Turn order needs to be consistent. But uh, they all got to play their favorite, uh, you know, Marvel. We've only had we only have the base game and the Spider Man. Uh, uh, expansion, but they pretty much got to, everybody got to play a hero they wanted to play, and um, uh, it, they had a good time. So I got to GM Marvel United today for a couple hours, and, and really had a ball. Very cool. It's a very fun game. It's engaging. I had I had fun playing it, too, with my with my son, so it's one of those games that can be fun across different age, age ranges. Thanks. Very good. Uh, my geek week, the, the first thing was that, um, I sat down to do some painting, which was I was going to say, good. I was going to put money on painting. That's right. So I've been working on this guy. So for our listeners, it's a games workshop Chimera that I am painting up. Right. So obviously he's a work in progress. I decided to go with like an ice blue theme with him. Um, but I think the contrast that I'm going to be able to get, like on the wings, you know, and, and some of the bone and then the heads, like I'm going to do like a red head for the bird one and like a brown head for the for the wolf one right here. And um, and then green tail with the serpent dragon thing there. I think I think the contrast of that will make it look a little less like a, an ice monster, um, but still like that blue base will be kind of nice. So. Um, I need to get him on the table to practice with him to see if I really want to take him to Adepticon. I um, like one of the big things that Jason Jason happened to Jason and I this week is that we got tickets to um, go to Adepticon this uh, March. So it's like um, six weeks away, or two, I guess it's about two months away. And I haven't settled on a warband yet, which means that I need to settle on a warband to be able to paint the warband if it needs painting, and then go from there. So. I, I'm kind of, I don't, the word the freak out is not where I'm at right now, but I, I'm a little nervous that I haven't really settled in on a, on a war band. And you I realized them all, bring them all beside the night before. Right. And I think, I think part of the problem is that the reason why I haven't settled on a war band is that I play so many different ones just to try out things that I, I haven't found like my niche yet, you know? Yeah. So, uh, are you going to bring a monster? I don't know. Chimera. Like, 
I mean, I have the Chimera to go, right? And if I'm going to bring a monster, it's probably going to be a Chimera. But I've been kicking around like a Death List too, that you know, like um, has some yeah. has some different things in there. So I don't, I don't know, and I, you know, I don't either. I think monsters are super powerful, um, but I kind of want to bring that ogre list just to be a monster hunting list, right? Just right. to see how it goes. So I was gonna, I don't know. I, I was gonna go to Adepticon this year. You guys didn't include me. I was very hurt because <laughs> I had a I had a buddy pass on uh, Southwest Southwest, right? Oh wow! Considering so, my wife and I were going to use it, but that cuts off like two weeks before Adepticon. So I'm like, oh, mm. no, we just won't go. Yeah. But then I would it. have a spouse with me in Chicago in a cold month. That would yeah. have been very very unpopular. As I go game. Yeah. Yeah. It's a recipe for disaster right there. Sweetie, it's okay. I won't go. I don't need to go to this one. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, the second Geek Week thing that I did is I watched the premiere of The Last of Us on HBO. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and so for the record, I have not played the games because I didn't have a PS4 for like the longest time. However, my brother did give me a PS4. I think I talked about this on the show a little while ago. And it does have the Last of Us game on there, so I'm kind of interested. And I might, I might do this thing where I play the game along with the show to see what the differences are. Like that might be kind of cool because, like, they had got huh. like an hour show, you know, and yeah, and play it. And That'd see, be interesting. See, yeah, see how it is because we had a guy in our in our um, Discord channels today say that um, the opening episode was basically like, shot for yeah. shot for the game right and mm -hmm. i'd be kind of curious to play it and see how that how that is and how it feels it, that will be curious there have been other transformations into the movie or tv industry there watchmen was an example right it was a shot for shot off of the yeah. the frames of the comics um but it wasn't two well mixed received, reviews yeah. It, yeah two mixed reviews but i think uh you know there's been a lot of years under the belt here to know what people like i'm sure they'll be able to tailor this one and they've got a good they've got a good uh cast yeah and so it, yeah yeah so a couple of things one um we have seen like assassin's creed be turned into a movie to eh. i mean it was kind of eh, right um we've seen like uncharted be turned into a movie which is also a naughty dog game right and it's um and it's like a pl one of those playstation exclusives that did a little bit better but i would argue that that was because it had mark Wahlberg and tom holland in it right like mm -hmm. to to like the story itself was okay but the acting and like the personalities that were the actors like definitely carried it a little bit more yeah I, uh, as one who played the Uncharted games and enjoyed them, yeah. I think that it was a true to the game uh, I do too. adaptation. Yeah, I thought, I I thought they're pretty pretty good, and I agree that I think the re one of the reasons it did good is because they had good cast. Yeah, for sure. And so that that's I did get my hopes up for this um, Last of Us, even though again I haven't played the game, so I don't have that many expectations. But knowing that you've got um, Pedro Pascal who we know as the Mandalorian, right? He's also, he was also in Game of Thrones. Like he's got some really good acting chops under him. And I thought he did such a really, really good job um, it, it, in this. Uh, you have Bella Ramsey, who was in Game of Thrones. She was Lady young Lady Mormont in that show. Um, and she it plays kind of the main character girl in there. And um and she was really good. And then you had, um, and I'm forgetting her name right off the top of my head, but it was a lady who was in Fringe, um, the main character, the main actress in Fringe. Um, she was playing um, basically one of the main characters as they were uh, getting out of Dodge. So she, um, everybody was a uh, great actors, like a lot of experience doing kind of serious. TV shows, right? So, and and major production. So good to it was, it was good to see. It was a really good episode. My wife watched it with me, and she was like, "I don't know if this was a good idea watching something this intense like at nine o'clock at night." 
mm-hmm. 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> so, because it was a little intense. And the thing is, as you walk into these like post apocalyptic shows, and in the beginning, everything's great and dandy and fine and everything like that, you know? And so, you know, the shoe's going to drop sometime. You just don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, it will. You just don't know how. And so like it's it's kind of always interesting to watch how that how that um, happens. So you just need to get her to play the game with you and then watch the show, yeah, play the apparently. game, watch the show. See how that yeah. works out for you. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, so <laughs> far, I give you a thumbs it's up. part of the experience. You have That's to right. part of the experience. <laughs> I thought you wanted to do things together, babe. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so far, love, two I, thumbs I, up. Uh, I, I was gonna say on that note, that's yeah. funny. I, I like to. Uh, uh, I'll bring stuff up on Netflix that looks pretty intense, and uh, I'll say, "Hey, babe, let's just watch the trailer." And like two, thir- uh, ten seconds in the trailer, she's like, mm-mm, "Nope, mm-mm, nope, <laughs> nope, mm-mm, mm-mm, nope." <laughs> I'm like, all right, <laughs> that's great. But two that's thumbs great. up, huh? Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I think it's going to be one of um, HBO's um, kind of big shows that they'll have for a while. We'll see. Pedro Pascal is pretty good. My favorite, my favorite role for him is in the movie Prospect, 2018 Prospects, uh, sci-fi movie. It's an indie movie. If you haven't I seen, saw a trailer you should. for that the other day. It is yeah. a great movie. He has a ama- he has like almost Shakespearean dialogue in that whole movie. It's it's really good, really good writing. And uh, don't need to go into it here. We we actually covered it about it about a year ago on another on another uh, episode. But uh, great great movie. Recommend you pick it up and take a look. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So yeah, that was my uh, geek week. And uh, so it sounds like we're just continuing the trend, guys. Great geek weeks, of course, all the time. So uh, let's move on to the news. Welcome to Tabletop and Beyond News. I I love how the quality of that is determined by how the distance that Dan has uh, to the microphone <laughs> with his mm-hmm. phone, you know. Mm-hmm. And we've never seen it before, really, until you know, until now. Yeah. So I'm just waiting for the producer of the show to help me get a good uh, drop in with a lower third. Now that we're in video. So it was a little easier to do uh, it, now that everyone can see what a mess we make on our, our low. Yeah, end, that's uh, okay. It's okay. We're real. We're, ma- that yeah. too. It's we're making real. it authentic. We're, de- we're down to earth, right, Jay? It's yeah. real. Authentic. It's authentic. <laughs> right yeah. here. Um, Geek, we- Geek News. Gen Con announced badges for the 2023 convention. They're going to go on sale on January 29th. So uh, we're recording cool. this mid-January. We're a couple weeks away, and you can give money to Gen Con and lock in your badge. A four-day pass, which I highly recommend, even if you're only doing three days, is $135. It's gone up. Uh, Single-day passes for Thursday and Friday are 70 and a Saturday passes are 85 A Sunday pass is $17. <laughs> so if any of you local Indianapolis fiends just want to go to Gen Con one day, drop the 17 bucks, and I think you'll have a great convention. Yeah, it's great for Jason, people who just want remember... to hit the exhibit. Yeah. Jason, do you remember... Um how much the badge was last year i thought it was like 120 i don't remember oh, because it it's still it's still carried over from oh, okay uh like before covid for me yeah i rolled I was, mine over twice yeah yeah so i was kicking around the thought i was like was it like because i i paid for it because i didn't roll mine over i didn't have one before in 2020 uh-huh. Um, and so I was like oh man i thought it was just, i thought it was like 110 but maybe it was like 120 to 125. But it has gone up. Well, yeah. I, I don't That's expect inflation. it. I, yeah, I don't expect it to say the same price forever when the cost of Wheaties has gone up a buck fifty. So you know. Well, and you know, I got a I got a nice meme today that 
said this Valentine's Day, get her something expensive. And it was a guy holding a dozen eggs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I was just going to say eggs. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I guess there's another version of the bird flu going around killing like millions of chickens right now. There's a simple solution to this, but that's for another day. Yeah, that's not no, this wrong to be chicken podcast. Farmers. What is that? Yeah. Is that to is that to let uh, people in our county have more than three chickens, um, or let them have chickens at all? But however, that's the libertarian and all of us talking, and that's not for this podcast. That's for our <laughs> other podcast that we have, which is the libertarian and us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> which we don't have. <laughs> is that the hidden the hidden podcast that Justin has on the side? Right for our exactly. Patreon listeners, they're going to be able to listen to our political rantings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no. Anyway, well, what's um, funny is I think that I think we we don't really go into politics on the show. We're not gonna, but we shouldn't. It's I bad. think I think we share um, amongst the three of us. I think we have pretty diverse political views inside of our own little circle. Uh, that's I think true. we share I think we share a lot of talk topics. There's the Venn diagram, but it would be interesting. Maybe we should have like once a year like hey, this is the political show. No. Opting no. out. Opting <laughs> out. Okay. Uh, there hey, are restrictions big... on my service category working for the federal government. I can't <gasps> I can't talk that's about I, my mean... civil my uh, my civil rights are limited and my freedom of speech is limited about oh. what I can say about politics. Mm, Public interesting. True. Yeah, so you guys got to do it without me. That's why the person who's on our libertarian podcast la, la, is la, named la, la, Pan la, Domeroy. La, la, la. No, <laughs> no, you just told the great search engine in the sky. Stop it, Stop Pan Domeroy. Yeah, that's all right. Chat Chat GPT already has it logged in. That's right. Exactly. It just it just trained. Yep. It's gonna pull out somewhere. Moving sorry. right along, we have a second. Oh, sorry, item dance box. Oh, yeah, what's the what's the continued news? Let's reel this back in. Why don't you take the second item, Justin Danger Smith? Yes, sir. So the second item of the day is that the 2023 Warhammer Open Series was just announced a couple of days ago, which provides pathways to the U.S. Open uh, Championship in November. Now. The Warhammer Championship Series is for Warhammer 40K, Age of Sigmar, Kilt, and Kill Team. Uh, they did say that at specific venues, they may have hmm. uh, events for Underworlds, Blood Bowl, and Horus Heresy. Do you notice something missing there, Jason? <laughs> yeah. Are so you guys going to cry I... about Warcry? Yeah, so I uh, wrote a an angry Karen message to the GW rep that I know, being like, "Dude, what the heck? Like, where's the war cry? Like, why does GW consistently ignore its own game? Like, Blood Bowl over War Cry? Like, are you serious right now? Uh, but, Blood Bowl's Blood Bowl's got a pretty big history. Behind it's it. got Blood Bowl has a very cult like following, <laughs> right? Yeah, Which is I, good. I guess their cult is a little more mean than ours, maybe. Maybe. It could <laughs> maybe. be. Maybe. It yeah. could be. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, but he said that um, they're looking at putting it in there. It's just the, the Warhammer communications team didn't add it in. So and I'm like, well, this this it's the, not encouraging, you know? Yeah, it's a Warhammer. Hey, so. yeah. Games Workshop is still putting out gigantic $300 box sets for Warcry. Are they not? I know. On they a are. regular basis? Yeah. I'm sorry. I belong. I still own. I'm way bought into one or two mini word games that have not had a new product out in 24 months. That's true. Nor will they pretty much ever. But yeah. sometimes the company will post new cards online you can print. Hmm. So <laughs> take your tears about Warcry not getting attention and go park up someplace else, bucko. <laughs> well, uh, the locations for. The uh, Warhammer Open series. Now, this is kind of important because when you go to these Warhammer Open events, they can get you a golden ticket to the invite-only championship that happens in November. So the Warhammer Open events that you can register for are in Kansas City, Tacoma, and Tampa throughout the year. And the championship will be in Atlanta in November, um, which isn't terrible. They did it in New Mexico last year. 
And the problem with New Mexico, it was freaking hard to get to because it was in like Albuquerque, outside of yeah. Albuquerque. And apparently it was at this amazing spa. Like, like it was gorgeous, beautiful, but you couldn't go anywhere for food. And so you had to pay like spa hotel resort prices for food. Like everybody was complaining about the price of like getting a sandwich or something like that, you know? So, um, I think by doing it in Atlanta, they're going to open up a few more options. So, uh, a lot. anyway, you just yeah. go to the varsity. If you're in Atlanta, the varsity, that's the great, that's the great, the college grease pit. Is that on peach tree? <laughs> I, <laughs> people from the Atlanta reason why is there's that. like there's like eight roads in downtown atlanta named peach tree named peach tree yeah yeah well, like i'm not even kidding right. you you're like wait is this north peach tree or south peach tree or right. the peach tree in northwest or the peach tree in the yeah. southwest like yeah peach tree is everywhere so anyway good time so but if you're interested in uh in those things uh keep an eye out because it will open up and Given the popularity of what it was last year, it'll fill up pretty quickly. So keep an eye out for sure. And hopefully, hopefully we'll see some more crying there somewhere. I did offer my services to run some of it. If they need yeah. somebody. Yeah. yeah do you, I think they probably, it's probably going to be next year. Hopefully. Yeah. I Fingers don't, crossed. I don't, I mean, I don't see how the communication seems probably like, wait, what? There's another game. Right exactly oh we don't we can't work that in it's too late it's pretty wild i i will say this and this is kind of my closing thought with with this on my on my end but um it's pretty wild to see I, like i'm in a facebook group and i'm seeing more and more people joining it with these new box releases right like the models look amazing the train looks amazing yeah and you're seeing and with the rules the 2.0 compendium rules that were published online you're seeing a lot of people flooding into warcry and playing it and you're starting to see a shift of mentality on the facebook page at least anyway of people accepting that this can be a competitive game because before they were just like this is a narrative only game narrative only and um i think with the success that we had at nova open adepticon last year or some of these other places that you're seeing that Warcry can absolutely be a, a competitive event we saw adepticon sell 30 tickets in 15 minutes or two hours basically mm -hmm. you know like it was sold out in the first two hours that it was open which it didn't even fill up last year and i think part of that was you know post-covid stuff but how many did we have it open it sold, sold out? out yeah oh and i mean jason and i had to be on a waiting list to get in yeah oh geez yeah because we were at church <laughs> yeah right but, yeah but uh how many people did we have at open did we have 15 players at open we had 16 16 yeah yep yeah so yep, we had 16 i anticipate like if, if things go well with adepticon i anticipate that we'll have a full boat and i, I did 32 tickets like nice so we'll see we'll see how that goes anyway um yeah so that's pretty much the news we had and there's a big reason why we don't have more news items it was because there was a 900 pound gorilla slash elephant uh gorilla fent in the room with us that decided to dominate all of the news all the tabletop news all the tabletop talk mm -hmm. uh if you were on social media and you're following any kind of rpgs you couldn't miss it because it was all about Hasbro, all about Wizards of the Coast, and all about the open gaming license and the ch proposed changes that they wanted to make to it. And so, as we said earlier on the show, normally we don't take a news item and dive into it for a, a, a main topic. But Jason, you and I spent a good chunk of time earlier in the week really dissecting Mm -hmm. What was the heart of the issue with the open gaming license? And I know, Dan, your brain is about to explode with all of the different stuff that's happening with it. So we thought that we would break this down for some of our listeners, kind of give some of our takes and talk about a little bit of the fallout that's happening in real time right now with this. So, Dan, can you tell us just from the top, like, what is the OGL and why does it matter? So, um, in the uh, turn of the century period, about uh, 23 years ago, there was a big movement 
towards open gaming. Uh, gaming had had uh, RPGs had had some highs and had some lows. Um, it wasn't um, during that period of time. Magic: The Gathering was making way more money for Wizards of the Coast than D and D, and this was uh, one of the strategies to expand out who, uh, how many people are participating in the game to build up the game, the RPG game culture. And so particularly Wizards of the Coast put out a thing called the Open Gaming License, which allowed um, um, individuals and companies to publish things that were compatible with D&D, that were compatible with uh, a system reference document. Now that system reference document has changed since 2000. It's changed a bunch of times, but the core of the OGL has has only changed just a little bit um, up until just recently, or rumored to. It, on paper, it hasn't really changed that much since uh, 2000. But it, it basically allowed other companies to put out 5e compatible stuff. Now, if you really got into the nitty gritty and you got a lawyer to look at the open gaming license it probably restricts you more than it opens things up for you. What it does do is you say, if you publish something open under the open gaming license, you're basically signaling to wizards of the coast, that you're going to play by their rules. And if you play by their rules, they won't sue you and everybody's happy right up until that point. However, had you gone on your own, you probably could have been able to do a lot more under fair use than you would have in the more restricted open gaming license. So the open gaming license was a little bit of a mechanical truce that you would make. So you could make a buck off of D&D by publishing your adventures, but there's only certain things you're allowed to copy verbatim. Those are listed out. And there are things you're not allowed to copy verbatim, and those things are explicit in the open gaming license as well. So you can bring your own creativity you could publish something compatible with D&D and the community could grow. So that was the core idea behind the open gaming license. It took off. Other games were published that had nothing to do with the D20 system that D&D uses. The Fate system doesn't use a D20. That was published under a similar open gaming license. So was uh, the D6 system, Open D6, which is the original Wizards of the Coast system for Ghostbusters and the original Star Wars RPG. So that kind of gives you an idea about how the um, the system has worked up until this time. So Dan, just really quickly, um, just for terms, right? So we refer to OGL as the open gaming license, which is basically the copyrighted fine details, fine text, that uh, Wizards of the Coast uses to basically say this is the terms and conditions of using the open gaming license. Now, with that, they'll refer to a system reference document, right? And so for D&D that, or SRD, for D&D that SRD looks very, 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 very similar to the player's handbook, uh, minus a couple of things. Uh, but it's like, if you were to compare the D&D SRD with the player's handbook, you would be surprised about how similar they are, right? Like that it's got a lot of the same roles. It's got a lot of the same spells. It's got a lot of the same feats. Like it's got a lot of different things. Now that SRD has been updated and changed over time, as you said, uh, the question that I have for you is, are there multiple SRDs that fall under this open gaming license? Cause you talked yes. about the open D six one. So I think that's an important distinction right there, which is that an open gaming license is an umbrella for multiple SRDs, not just D and D. Right. And so some other companies have used the framework of the wizards of the coast, open gaming license as theirs. Um, mm -hmm. But really when push comes to shove, the most common use of the SRD has been the different versions of D&D. So there was a, uh, an, a there was advanced, there was a D&D, there was a uh, three, 3.0 and 3.5 D&D. There was version four and now fifth edition. So every time there's been a major update to Dungeons and Dragons, they have updated the system reference document, um, underneath the umbrella of the open gaming license. So 
Um, that's how that works. Now, other companies can copy and paste text and say, hey, this text applies to us instead of Wizards of the Coast. They mm -hmm. can, you know, take the open license and say, Bob and Joe's RPG system, you know, copyright mm -hmm. to 2023 instead of Wizards of the Coast, copyright 2000. So if you go online and you do some research on what the, the original OGL is from 2000, it's Wizards of the Coast copyrighted in 2000. What's your next question? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a quick so, question. So yeah, when yeah, you said fair use, can you define fair use? In uh, I'm, I will point you to the Electronic um, uh, Frontier Foundation has a great article on this subject, as well as Corey Doctorow um, on doctorow.medium.com. Um, good riddance to the open gaming license. A fair use has four criteria and I'm not going to go into it because I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert on it, but there's two articles that explain how uh, the mm -hmm. fair use component. So, so some of the fair use components are, for instance, if you come up with a way of rolling dice and figuring out what a fair way of doing battle with a monster is, that's actually not copyrightable. Like I could come out with Dan's RPG and it could look a lot like D and D. And as long as I don't use their exact words, I don't copy and paste words out of theirs and put it into mine, then they really can't take me to court. Now, if I start talking about forgotten realms, if I start talking about other copyrighted ideas, right, that wouldn't be fair use. Okay. Like their lore, stuff like that. That's the kind of thing that they can copyright in their documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I heard pretty often this week was that mechanics aren't copyrighted. It's the interpretation of them that can be, right? So someone made an argument, and again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how valid this is, but it sort of made sense to me, which is I can write a song and I can copyright that song, which is the arrangement of the beats and the notes and all that stuff, but I can't copyright the piano. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because the piano is the piano, right? Yep. And uh, But I can copyright how I use the piano, which is the song that comes out, you know? Precisely. So, so you can't copyright the mechanics of some of these role-playing games because, you know, the, w the way that they are and apparently that stems back to a supreme court case that sort of decided what you could copyright in terms of like what was allowable and not so yeah but um, i think that i think the musical piano uh analogy i think is good i think it breaks down as even though you can't copyright the piano you can restrict someone's use of using the piano to use your work to make money in a public setting mm. sure and which I think is what was part of what Wizards is getting at here. Right. And so that was a big question mark, right? And and that was what you're hearing from a lot of the naysayers of the new proposed changes, which is this doesn't even look like it's legal. Well, I don't think that, I mean, spoiler alert, I don't think that we'll get there to a legal challenge. Yeah, but I don't think so either. It would, have been, um, it would have been interesting to see how that legal battle would have played out because I think you make a fair point, Jason, in that... Um, Wizards of the Coast wasn't really talking about uh, their whole point behind a lot of this. A lot of the changes was that they were feeling like their open gaming license and even to a certain extent, the system reference document was being um, uh, utilized in a way that wasn't intended in the original 2000 agreement that was put out there. And meaning that Paizo has become a multi-million dollar company. Yeah. Uh, other companies are out there making millions off of Kickstarter and nothing is being recognized and getting kicked back to um, Wizards of the Coast. So, right. you know, that was, that was uh, one of the major impetuses. And they said that very clearly in the beginning of that open gaming license text, which is, this was the, the open gaming license is being utilized in a way that was not intended in 2000. And this is meant to rectify some of that. Right. And, and so just to catch some of our listeners up, there was a leaked document that was very lengthy that um, uh, was leaked on the internet by Gizmodo and IO9. And uh, it basically was a very, it was a, 
purported to be the version that they were just about to come out with, which was a much more restricted OGL 1.1 is what they called it. But what it was intended to do was to vacate anyone who had been using the previous open gaming license. And that really got everyone's hackles up because number one, uh, certain people have their livelihoods based on the 1.0 a version of the open gaming license. <clears throat> Paizo comes to mind. There's a couple other companies that are, that, that their livelihoods are largely based on or have been based on at different parts of their, of their company's lifespan on the open gaming license. So everyone was pretty ticked off on the internet. Um, there's pros and cons to what, WotC was trying to do or what Hasbro was trying to do. Um, oh, there you go. Now you said it. I, what, what it's, I, it's, it's not WotC. It's, it's Hasbro. Really, it's really Hasbro. It's really weird to have your it, it, outside of the world of role playing. The fact that any of this would be open and usable is just pretty strange. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, you hand this stuff to a, a, a Hasbro lawyer that's used to licensing, you know, Barbie and Mattel and, and uh, Transformers and Star Wars, they look at OGL as something that is a gigantic uh, loss. They're, they're losing money. But what they don't understand is that the community has built up momentum over many decades, and this was one of the ways in which the community right. grew instead of right. shrink. Um, circling back to this perpetuity idea, there's a difference between non-revocable and perpetuity under the license. So they can say it's in perpetuity, but that does not mean it's irrevocable. Those are two different mm -hmm. ideas. So you can say, I'm going to perpetually put this license out until I decide to not perpetually put it out anymore. If I perpetually put it out and have it being unrevocable, I give away my rights to revoke it later. Uh, the OGL is not irrevocable. So they do have the right to revoke it. Now, mm -hmm. what has happened is, is the outcry... And the version of the the um, the the leaked version that we don't know whether it's official or not, basically gave Wizards of the Coast the right to take other people's work that had been published under the open gaming license, give them a thirty days no notice, and then they can use that material and they can go make money off of it. And whether or not that's the truth or not the truth, we don't know. It's a leaked document, but obviously that sent everybody's heads through the roof. I mean, that was that was just tad about to um, holy war. Um, what had happened was for those who who haven't been following along, there was a big online outcry, and the largest un unregistration of D and D beyond the online system has happened you know, thousands and thousands of people to a degree to which the uh, Wizards of the Coast had to issue a statement and say, okay, we did the wrong thing. We were pointed the wrong way on OGL 1.1. There will be a new one. We're not sure what it's going to be. Just stop freaking out everybody. And that's yeah, I think what they published. So the, the story that I heard was that, um, and, and, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, but this OGL 1.1 was sent out um, to a lot of these big companies like Paizo and and Cobol Press and stuff like that for comment. And that's where it leaked, right? So mm -hmm. it wasn't finalized. Um, however, I will say this. The mob mentality of the internet, whether right or wrong, doesn't like details. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, mobs are, are, are notorious so true. for loving details and nuance. Mobs are yeah. nuance. <laughs> And so, and so when you have um, a company that says, Hey, we're putting this out here. We want your comment on it. And then somebody leaks it and says, Oh my gosh, look what's happening. And then the collective freak out happens. I think Hasbro was like, uh, well, this wasn't finalized, but people were acting as if it was, um, you, you mentioned yeah, but a couple ha Hasbro, of things. Yeah, Hasbro should have known you, you, yeah, in today's known. day and age, yes. nothing doesn't get yes. leaked 100 double negative there but you get the idea yeah. right so and and i'd like to make the point too dan that if you look at any other ip honestly honest to goodness if you go to games workshop that ip is so closed yeah compared oh, yeah. to this like 
this like it is basically like you can't use our logos you can't use our lore you can't use our pictures you can come up with a story if you want to but heaven forbid you even mention the name space marine or else we're coming after you you know what i mean like it is so locked down yeah comparatively and so that was kind of my initial thing is i'm like wait a minute i don't understand because i was reading the 1.1 and i'm like I don't understand why people are freaking out like this because it seems like Watsy and Hasbro are sort of course correcting given what the general normal IP kind of license looks like. And in fact, this this OGL covers only PDF print materials. Like if you were to talk about movies, music, yeah. um, live action type stuff, um, you actually have... To, it's actually a completely different agreement. It's yeah. actually a Wizards of the Coast creator content license that you have to go look at. And if you look at that one, that one is pretty restrictive too. Yeah, like it's a creator content. It's very restrictive, um, way more restrictive than the OGL. And so, I, I I was sitting here thinking like, what is the what is the freak out here? There were three main points that I think that Jason and I over the course of the week that we came to that. Um, that people were kind of really getting wrapped around the axle with this, right? The first one was the idea that Watsi could be taking 20 to 25%, uh, you know, for those companies making over $750,000, mm-hmm. right? That's number one. Revenue. Uh, revenue. Yeah, revenue. revenue. Not yeah, profit. Thank you. Yeah, revenue. Royalties. Um, royalties. Yeah, royalties. Well, it's royalties on anyone who makes over 750 k yeah. in revenue. In revenue yeah. based on their stuff, right? Based on... Yeah. According two, to the leaked document. Yes. Uh, number two, um, it was the idea that they were canceling the one, uh, 1.0A mm-hmm. and replacing it with 1.1. So any products that were based off of 1.0A in the past were now null and void. And you had to sign up within 15 days, essentially, to the agreement um, without like figuring out how it didn't give you a lot of time to figure out how to pivot if you needed to pivot. Right. So it was like sign or die basically. Yeah. Come Um, up with a new business model overnight. Overnight. Uh, And then the third one and uh, the third one, and and we're going to talk about each of these, I think, but the third one was that um, in a little small paragraph, it basically said that if you create anything under this open gaming license, that it becomes a sub license to this um, to this open gaming license, and therefore uh, Watsi owns it from a license standpoint, and uh, can basically cancel any of your revenue that you make from it. They can take it as their own. They can market it as their own, and uh, you have no legal recourse, basically. Um, in that one little paragraph that was there. So those were the three, I think, main freak out things that were in this document. So let's start with the 750K um, amount here. And and in their own publication, they said, well, we only think 20, there's only 20 companies yeah. in the world that are making this money. So that doesn't apply to you. This is a rich man problem. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> I think that, that's that a bad argument take. did not hold sway because yeah. everybody believes they're going to have the great idea that makes them 750 K, even though they right. could go to their grave and never, never move an inch on it. That's that's a, I, I thought that that was someone in their PR department did not review that line very well. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the fact that they called out some specific companies where yeah. they're just like, Oh yeah, it's only affecting like 20 companies like Paizo and Cobalt press. And so, uh, I mean, they called out some very specific companies. If you, if you like, look oh. at publishing numbers, the second largest RPG in the world is Pathfinder and it's Paizo. Yeah. So in one way, it looks like they're directly targeting their number two. This is like basically Coke figuring out a way to make other colas illegal. Or yeah, to make so, money off of every RC and every every Pepsi sold. <laughs> yeah, with with this with this idea that you are charging based on that seven hundred fifty thousand dollar revenue, I said to Jason, um, because really how it works out is this: you are not charged if zero to fifty thousand dollars 
um, you don't really have to do anything other than um, register and say report and say, this is who I am. And you have to put a content creator badge on your work, right? You don't even have to report what you're doing. You just have to register with them and say that you're yeah. doing 50,000 to 750, seven, $749,999. No, sorry. I'm going to say this. $750,000. You have to report the income that you are getting off of the products that you're selling, right? As well as register. <laughs> sorry. Um, however, $750,001. That is when you start getting charged royalties on it. And if it's just a product that you're putting out that is not crowdsourced, uh, you're paying 20%. And if it is a crowdfunded thing like a Kickstarter, so think of Matt Colville and his um, you know, Book of Monsters that he did or the Sieges uh, thing that he did, um, that is, you get charged 25%. Now, I think a, a collective freakout that happened was that people literally thought that you were being charged 25% of $750,000, which is a lot of money. I get, I get if that were the case, that is a lot of money. I did the math. And if you made a million dollars on a Kickstarter campaign, you would be paying about $64,000 in royalties. Now, that equates to about 6.4% of your total revenue. Is that a deal breaker? Do you guys think that that is a deal breaker amount? I think for indie companies, absolutely. I think there are plenty of indie companies that don't understand, that have used Kickstarter, don't understand mm -hmm. the full costs of a startup, okay. and have, have, have sunk themselves in the hole even when they've gotten a million uh uh, backing or not in the whole but of just chewed up especially with what's the we've talked about this before what's like the one thing in kickstarter that board games and other things always come back to you on shipping shipping yeah they know no one no one has been able to effectively say how much shipping is or they come back and say guys we love you we're just going to eat it that they, they could eat six percent of their profit yeah Right in shipping and shipping fluctuations alone in our yep, economy yep. and printing fluctuations and costs and everything. So I, I think that um, it's well, I'll say it this way. I don't think it's a deal breaker. I don't think it's insignificant, okay. which means if they think I'm only going to be a seventy thousand dollar, I only need I only need five thousand dollars. And I know my fan base is only so big. I'm only get, you know, maybe seventy thousand dollars. I'm just not going to worry about it. No big deal. But if somebody is making a book, a big, you know, opius or whatever it is, and they think there's the possibility I could go from seven, you know, 0.75 to one, I've got to immediately bake in that 6% regardless. regardless. I got to put that into my cost from the beginning. But I, so I think if you plan for it, it's not a big deal. Right. I mean, it's 6%. I get it. But if, if you, you plan, plan for, for it, it, it's fine. You just have to plan for it, which means prices are going to and, go up and to plan you, for it. If you go, if you get to seven, $7,499,000 and that's where your Kickstarter ends and you plan for 6%, that's 6% profit that you are going to end up with because you allocated that as a cost essentially. Sure. Right. Yeah. So if I, if I put yeah. on my MBA hat, if you look at that as a franchise fee, you're yeah. you're doing great. Right. That is not an expensive franchise fee at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you put on, I'm a gamer, I'm a small time thing, you know, I'm scrappy, you know, I, I live in this art form world. It just seems like, why are you taking money off my table? This is the only money I'm ever going to make in my life. What, why do you think you have a right to it? Right. Which is how that internet mob mentality yeah. Yeah. reacts to it they're not reacting to it like business people they're reacting to it like you guys are being jerks i don't want to do business with jerks i don't want to i don't want to play in this jerk sandbox it's an emotional reaction yeah yeah well and the other reaction i saw was if somebody said well listen i mean people are people are making some some scrap off of or some scratch off of uh, off of D and D's game or uh, Watsy's game D and D. I mean, like some people are making not only a living but a good living off of this game. 
you know, and so the uh, Watsi should have the right to be able to say, listen, if you are using our game to enrich yourself, like there needs to be a little bit of kickback because yeah, this is where it is. When people propose that, <laughs> boy, the mob mentality, let them have it, right? Like they did not so, like the idea. So you could, you could, we could paint the paint everybody who's mad like a mobster and hand them a pitchfork and sure. uh, a, a torch. You could also look Give at it from swap. the other perspective, which is from the O and open, right? So from yep. the open source perspective, what Hasbro's doing is pulling the rug out from under creators in the first place. And Cory Doctorow's point, along with the Electronic, uh, Free, um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, basically said, the OGL is a hot mess. You shouldn't even mess with it. It's not even worth your time. Go do whatever you want and publish it. Stop messing with this. If the new OGL is worse than the first one, the first one was bad. It wasn't even a good, it wasn't even a good open license. It's not like mm -hmm. the GNU license. It's not like Creative Commons. It's not like anything else. So don't yeah. don't you know lose your minds over something that had very little value and it was more valuable to Watsi than it was to everybody else, to be quite frank, which is yeah. why Paizo hasn't published. The only reason why they've published under OGL is so that other content creators can use their stuff and, and they can, it can be mimicked out. Um, but I think it's really important that the, the, the companies that need to live and breathe on a truly, a uh, perpetual and truly irrevocable game license are going to create their own called the open RPG creative license or ORC O R C. Yep. <clears throat> and it, it's going to be not managed by Paizo. It's going to be managed by a law firm and eventually it'll be managed by a nonprofit. It will have support from Cobalt press, green Roman Ronin, sorry, legendary games, role for combat, rogue genius games and other publishers. And so everybody else whose businesses, their business model was, they were just waiting. They were just hoping Watsi wouldn't do this. Right. They, they're they already pulling up stakes because it's not really necessary to live in this 5e compatible world really anymore. And they've determined that they can go do whatever they want. Yeah. I, I said to Jason earlier this week that um, especially with the revenue thing, right? This revenue thing was, has so little effect on like 99% of the third party creators out there, right? It's really not going to affect them very much, but it is absolutely a scud missile that is pointed at Paizo and Cobalt press, right? Like this was, this was just like um, targeted. It is yeah. a targeted well, effort. So. Well, and, and um, the, the, do the ex machina folks right mm -hmm. they had a deal well, with amazon i don't think well, dnd so, got a slice of that did they get a slice so, of any of that so oh. here's the thing though is is ex machina critical role show yeah all that stuff is covered under specific different agreements with them it is not covered yeah. under the open gaming license yeah so uh, but, but however critical roles uh, written products that they point. put out, like the the Wildemont stuff, like that is yeah. covered under the OGL, right? So, right. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that, sorry, that's a good clarification. Right. I apologize. Yeah. Um, so the second thing um, was, and, and I think we've touched on this. And I don't know that we need to beat this to death anymore. Which is that there are companies that believe that this open gaming license was in per, you know, in perpetuity that. Um, that they they thought that they would have it that even if with the advent of a new open gaming license that the old ones would still remain in place but it did not this was to replace it and so um that really peeved off a lot of like big names in the in the industry because a lot of their stuff was you know built so heavily on that open gaming license um and again i don't think we need because we've talked about it but the third one jason um you and i talked about this and i'd like your opinion on this um, this was this is the idea that Watsi owns your stuff. Um, you, they can give you 30 days notice of like basically they're going to take it from you um, or you pull it down essentially. And if you don't, they own it and they could like market it 
whatever. What's what is your thought on that? I think this is the one that's probably going to piss most people off. To be honest, yeah. uh, it's the one that would give that gave me pause. I look at the number, the 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 royalty thing, and I think uh, whatever. If I'm make selling something that makes seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'm like, great, that's awesome, you know. But this part is what I could think would really upset people because we have this creative gene inside us that wants to be creative and wants has a pride of ownership. And, and actually, the wording in the draft that came out was not that they own your content. In fact, they specifically say you own mm-hmm. the new and original and original content you create. So the part of the OGL that you include in your content, they own. But the part of the content you created that used the OGL content, you own the new and original one you create. Here's the problem, though. They then said, you agree to give us a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, <laughs> royalty-free license to that content for any purpose. Period. Yeah. It's ours. I read that and if I'm like, want. I don't want to work. I read that and I think, I don't want to work with you. You're, yeah. you're being a dick. <laughs> I mean, you're just trying to take my stuff like and 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 I know they're looking down at Jason Bales and they're saying, who are you? You know, but you? At, at the same time, I'm kind of like, why would anyone put those words in there? That is so yeah. non collaborative in a in a gaming community that's all about co- shared content creation and community. And that's basically saying, no, sorry, we can do whatever we want. So here's my I, I don't know that it's a theory, but here's my take on this, because. Um, if you scroll down further in that OGL leak document, they go on for almost two pages about what kind of content they will allow and what they will not allow. And a lot of it is like, you know, um, discrimination based on sure. sexual orientation, sure. yeah. like, you know, uh, transgender, like they have a whole bunch of stuff, race, like they have a whole bunch of stuff. And you're talking like, it is a long, long section of the document. In, in what is essentially a nine page document, right? Like there's there's probably two pages dedicated to what is allowed, what is not allowed. And my take on this is that it gives them the freedom to unilaterally decide whether your product stays or whether it goes. You know, um, it, like if you do something that violates um, that little term because they have that license in place to like basically own your content, they can take it and it's no longer yours. Right. Because they don't want their name associated with all of that. Now was, is that super clumsy? I think absolutely. I think you can be like, you know, we will revoke any license if it doesn't meet this criteria or whatever, you know? Um, Yeah. So let me, let me take this, take that a step further. Right. So let's picture a situation where, uh, they come in and they say, we're going to just reuse your stuff. For example, maybe they're going to make a companion of the last five years of D and D, uh, you know, community material, and they're going to put it in something, they're going to sell it and they don't have to give you any royalty for it. Right. Well, so let's say that you do go, you do say, well, but remember I own the original content that's inside there. So you can't use my original content. If you try to have that argument, they, they did, they made us another statement in there to cover their butts on that end. And they say, you agree that nothing prohibits us from developing, distributing, selling, or promoting something that is substantially similar to a licensed work. So in other words, okay, even if you're going to keep yours, we can make something that is almost a copy paste of it. Right, right. So it's like if- these two bullets are so, so counter to, and this is this is why I think the internet storm, you know, rage, yeah. rage is rage quitting them right now, is because this, the money stuff, everyone rec- recognizes that RPGs, board games, they're growing. That's a huge industry. Everyone's working to make money. Everyone else is trying to do it too. But these two things are yeah. so counter to the community around board games the consumers that are in the board gaming and the role-playing game community that that i think that's honestly i think this is what you know stoked the fire we have uh, our rpg that's coming out with our patreon this month uh <laughs> is to grandmother's house we go i could totally see them saying oh we're gonna do this to grandma's house we go 
Yeah, yeah. What's <laughs> funny is that I wrote that as a Shadow of the Demon Lord adventure. Yeah. We right. converted it to 5e for our first release because we thought it would be the most accessible to everybody. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Well, <laughs> it still is. is it still technically I think so. is. Yeah. It still yeah. is. Yeah. But whatever. It's a, you know, it's a $5 PDF. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. But anyways, but I think this it, is what stoked the fire, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Well, it, and one of the things that one D and D was supposed to do was better monetize the D and D Beyond install base, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. which is why Watsi bought it. It was a, another company. They had to go buy that. Did they buy the whole company or just the platform? I can't remember. They bought they one bought or the whole one company. or both. They were kind and of so, a weird like shell company, and anyway. not shell is not the right yeah, word. I, I but, think I know. think they, I think they bought the company. I, I could be yeah. wrong. I, we reported on it like a year ago. I can't remember. But think about what happened when, if the whole purpose of one D and D was to better monetize that install base, and that install base shrunk overnight based on what they were doing with one D and D. Their whole strategy was completely flawed. Right? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And and I think it's interesting because a year ago when Watsi announced that they were going to be buying D and D Beyond, there was a huge uproar. Do you remember? A yeah. lot of people yeah. were like, "Oh my gosh, they're going to screw this up. They're going to put everything, and you know, you like you're going to have to do all this stuff. And there's no way that they're going to make it so you can buy a digital and physical bundle. And which is, you know, th that kind of outrage was wrong." in my opinion, because it was unfounded one and two, like it was just untrue. A lot of the things that there's, there's too much speculation around it. Right. Yeah. So when this initial OGL hubbub started coming out, I'm like, Oh, this is just more fan base speculation that's coming out about all of this. And then as I picked into the document and heard other people's kind of takes on it, I realized that there was something a little bit more, I guess, insidious like to, to the the OGL than just you know typical gamer outrage that we see. Right? Yeah, and I think it you know feeding the fire even more was the you know the multi confirmed source of the uh, the Watsi uh, employee that said I sat in these meetings with leadership. They absolutely are greedy. They only want to focus on the money. They have made statements like the consumer is getting in the way of our product strategy. Like, you know, an email from an employee saying that. Right. That's yeah. basically being kind of a thinking that they're taking on the whistleblower status, you know, to some degree. But th th that directly follows the leak of the document, the flame at war. And then someone in the company says, yeah, I confirm it. What do you think they are? They really are. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, I yeah. didn't hear it that one either. All over Reddit, all over Reddit, and and multiple news article sources. You know, it's funny is I actually found it when I was doing my daily French article read. Oh, ah, that's funny. Yeah, practicing my French, and I was like, "Ha!" Huh. And so then I I was like, "Okay, I gotta read this in English." You know, so I yeah. went, translated it. But yeah, I mean, multiple. Right. Uh, we should have pulled it up here, but Google it, you'll find it. But uh, anyways, it does, that, that kind of thing, you know, can be maybe there's always a little bit of it in between the line because we're not in the boardrooms, but it doesn't help their situation at all with the community. Well, so, they're a publicly traded company. They have to meet, you know, uh, shareholder expectations and return shareholder value. Yeah. They're not a community of artists anymore. Yeah. And so the fact that we have all these small little companies that go, well, what we need really is an interoperable open gaming system with a different system <laughs> reference document so we don't have to worry about these shareholders. I think that's fine because D and D still may continue to be the 900 pound gorilla and the big juggernaut that, it, that it always has been. I think the community just spooked them real bad by having as many people cancel their uh, D and D beyond subscriptions as they did and put them on the back heel. Um, so who knows what's going to happen next. If the version 1.1 came out how would that really fundamentally change very much? You would say, okay, well, if you were uh, if you were a consumer of Wizards of the Coast products, it won't affect you hardly at all. If you're a consumer mm -hmm. of Paizo Starfinder products, yeah. they may start putting out their their next edition, 
maybe based on a different system reference document. And guess what? RPG companies come out with a new edition X number of every X number of years. So we knew they were going to do that anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think what you might see is a hesitancy of, and, and, and this is, this is a good place to sort of end this conversation, which is what is the fallout of all of this? Right. Yeah. And I think, I think the first thing, Dan, that you talked about and Jason too, um, the, jumping ship from D and D beyond um, I'm hearing across all different kinds of channels, people who play D and D all the time saying, well, I'm looking for other systems to play. Uh, I've seen, I've seen chaosium free league publishing, like all these other people being like, Hey, come get our starter sets for 99 cents and try a new, try a new system today. If you're like yeah. really upset about it. And mm -hmm. first I mean, it's free. You gotta you gotta strike while the iron's hot too, right? So like you can you can get the digital version of Chaosium's um, Call of Cthulhu starter set for ninety nine cents right now, which yeah. is insane, <laughs> yep. insane. insane. I yeah. bought the uh, I should have put this in my Geek Week. I bought the Dune box set. It was uh, it's sixty dollars retail. I got a discount off of it, but. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a ninety nine cent box set. It was. It's a really nice one. It has all the custom yeah. dice in it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, those box sets are a great way to get people to just start playing a different 100%. game. There's so many games out there, and um, the quality of of all these other companies is really high right now. We we're not yeah. waiting on one company to kind of lead us around by the nose. Um. So well, and I think that's part of Watsi's real big misstep is that. Um, yes, they are, they are the juggernaut. It is hands down. They're the juggernaut, but they're kind of, I mean, this, the, the way that this kind of came out, it feels like they're kind of counting out these little guys, these little publishers, like take free league publishing, right? Like they're, they're small potatoes compared to, to Watsy, right? We love but, them. They're great. Boy, like the stuff that they've been putting out is like, higher quality than you'll get in a D, &D i haven't got my blade no. runner kickstarter yet oh really oh, i have mine oh yeah i think i'm the only guy in america that didn't get it <laughs> you may have to reach out to bjorn like show yeah. oh you should actually because it's past the time they said to reach out yeah oh really yeah side yeah. note though but uh, what it's do you think Justin? do you think that this is going on here my opinion mm -hmm. i don't think that this is the end of watsi at all but Maybe. I think I think that it is potentially a, a, a jumping board for these other companies to come in and start to displace and take a portion of the market now. Here's what's going to happen, in my opinion. All these people are going to be like, man, screw Watsi. We hate them. Like, it's so bad. Like, ah. And they'll go play a, uh, they'll go play a, a, a three, six month campaign of Call of Cthulhu or something. And people will be like, but we kind of like D&D. Like, <laughs> you know, the group will be like, we kind of like playing DD. And they'll look back at, at Watsi and they'll say, nothing much has really changed for us. Yeah. The supplements are still there. The the game books that they're putting out and the settings yeah. and all that. So just give it another setting or two with like another good book that comes out. And the DD &D movie that comes out, people get excited again. They'll be like, I want to be an owl bear. And they'll like... uh and they'll get back into it. Well, and I, game, I think that this is a blip, right? And, and it's and, so cyclical, yeah. Justin, because it fifth is. edition is a huge hit. It's the biggest hit they've had. But yeah. fourth edition went, they published a lot of books. They sold a lot of paper, but it was largely in the community. Except for the book books they moved, it was considered a flop. Three yeah. to pot three point five was considered a hit. Three dot oh was considered a miss. Second yeah. edition was considered a hit, you know. So if you just yeah. it's it just yeah. bounces back and forth. It's not that big of a deal. It it, it really is, and it's funny to, to watch the old hands that have been playing D and D for like thirty years or something like that. They're just like, okay, well, this is just the next iteration. Like you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I it think. is it is what it is, right? So we what do, do what a lot do you of think, people Jason? who won't give up a twenty year old edition all the time. They don't want you to buy right. new books. Why would they need to right. do that? Yeah, I I think that what we're going to see is um, they're going to have a dip in their projected revenue because of yeah. the Internet's cancel culture, right, reaction. Of, yep. Even if these people come back to D&D &D Beyond, they're going to be away from D&D &D Beyond for a period of time, which yep. is going to be a I, huge I dip in revenue. 
Yeah, we, well, that's a what, huge what they, dip in revenue projections. Oh yeah. What they could do, and they, they'll have a dip in revenue, and they have a high level of investment in one D and D, if it has an awesome digital component. Yeah. If they do their own roll twenty, and it's all integrated, and they do, mm-hmm. you know, if they get into D and D metaverse crap or whatever they want to do with one D and D to make it the an evolution of what RPG should be. They may just on pure novelty get people mm-hmm. to to get real interested again. I want to see what they're doing, even though I may not be a subscriber. I, I, as a spectator, I'm I can't wait to find out of about all the things they're doing to integrate a whole digital stack into the game. I think that they will have. They're going to use this as most companies do as an opportunity to innovate, to try to pull yeah. back excitement. Um, so. And it could be an opportunity. Well, well, here's what we have to see. We have to see how much the the board and the shareholders are actually going to let them try to recover to maintain the community they want versus just meeting, you know, the financial business uh, strategy and plan and roadmap that they have in place. Yeah. Because the boards don't like bad press, but they also really like lawyers. So they have a, a, a bit, there's going to be a bit of an internal problem here. Yeah. They were supposed to roll out 1.1 three times and they've canceled it three times which means they they haven't settled it yet they, it, yeah they could use not, this yeah, they could ready. they could they could spin this properly with an appropriate pr and yep. come out they could come out with something and says guess what you guys spoke we listened you're right the community was right we're gonna fix this you know here's our approach by the well, way this is it? all the awesome stuff out? we're doing yeah yeah. Yes, this is you, all the awesome stuff we have moving forward. Yeah, and you, we want you to be a part of it. We're going to make it more accessible. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. We're going to change our leadership to make sure we stay in the right direction. Right. So there's all sorts of things that they could do as a large company that are standard company strategies for recovering for things like this. And it'll be curious to see that um, take place. Yeah, they had a tweet yeah. saying, "Oh, guys, we rolled a one." Yeah, but. <laughs> Yeah, you guys get. Oh yeah, look it up on your own. It was. It's an but, interesting yeah. thing. But I yep. think I think they're missing the piece that Jason said that is going to fix this, which is one. We rolled the one, right? That's an important part. The second part is, but we promise that if you stick around, it's going to be great. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like they need that part. They need to be able to say, like, look at these things. Like, if you stick around, it's going to be great. You know, we understand and we're going to pivot away from all the bad things that you guys think and look at all these great things. Here's the new shiny stuff. And of course, we're going to be dedicated by a change of leadership, like like you said, Jason, right, with all of that stuff. So I, I think that they did the first part OK, which is like, oops, like this isn't what we thought it was. But I'm still hearing people being like, I don't care. I'm not going back. Like, I'll still play D&D, but I'm not buying another thing from WotC again. Yeah, we'll just keep I don't playing know. my old editions. Yeah, and I don't know how true that's going to be because you know what? There's going to like, there's going to be new things that come out, and they're going to be like, "Oh, that looks kind of cool," or or somebody in their gaming group is going to be like, "Hey, do you think we could try that game? <laughs> it looks pretty awesome." And then you know, next thing you know, they're like three sessions in, and yeah, you know. is there an online character builder? Because I I'd rather just build it online. Well, yeah. you got to go to D and D Beyond. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. here's the other thing that I thought of um, as we're talking. Most of the D&D Beyond memberships. Now, there's some that are billed monthly, but a lot of them are billed annually. You save quite a bit being billed annually. Um, You know, I don't obviously I don't know that we're going to see like numbers of subscribers that have actually left. I think there's just speculation around that, you know. Yeah. But even people who are like, I'm leaving D and D Beyond. Like, I think their yearly membership has already been billed for, you know. <laughs> and so if they come back, like in six months, it's as if they had never left. Really. Well, you it, know, it, so we we won't ever know the numbers, but we know the numbers were good enough to scare the company. Sure, 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 sure. Because they were they yep. changed course based off of yeah, yeah. Because that hit oh, them yeah. in the bottom line. Yeah. Um, I, I guess would, my point. That was a tell. I mean, my point was is that I paid fifty dollars, something like that, like at the beginning of my yearly membership, right? And that was for a year. And so, if I walked away and I said, "I'm quitting," and I even if I closed my account and closed it, 
like they still have my yearly fifty dollars. And if I opened it up again in six months, it will have it will be as if nothing had happened. So up, uh, you know, my my experience has been most with situations like that, if you contact customer support, they will still cancel and refund the remainder of your thing. Most most online places that I've experienced are like that. They'll, Dealing they'll, with crap with my girls, they them. prorate. And if Wizard chooses not to prorate, how much more they're are they going to stoke back. that fire? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know how much people really canceled if they had a huge library yeah. of books, digital yeah. books they were collecting. Yeah. I mean, yep. uh, if, if I was... They may have just said, just books, don't. Would I cancel my account? Yeah. <laughs> don't put me on recurring billing. <laughs> no, if, if, you have, if you have a monthly <laughs> or yearly, do you have access to the whole library? Uh, well, you well, always have access to stuff you have bought at retail. Yes. In, no, oh, oh, in, their, in their store, in their in digital store. store. Yeah. So here's the thing. What is, what, is I the, got, what is the what, first what, got, what do you get for your membership? It's you get. Um, Campaign control stuff, digital dice, being able to manage your sheet digitally. You can invite other players to come in and use your content that you have. It's an environment. Right? In terms of like character building and all that stuff. Um, there's a lot of digital integration with the books. So that like, for example, when I'm going up against yeah. Kobolds, I can hover over their name and it pops up their stat blocks and stuff like that within the adventure. Yeah. What you don't get is automatic. You There are some free content things that you'll get access to, which is like the player's handbook, some of the monster handbook, some of the DM yeah. guide, some of it, right? Um, if you want to unlock all of it, you need to purchase it. And so when I first started with D&D Beyond when it came out, they had a founder's pack. <clears throat> yeah, don't tell like, me about this. This just makes me mad. I know. It was, listeners um, and watchers. <laughs> I mean, the founders pack had all of the all of the content, all the five E content up to the Tome of Annihilation for like two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> Sorry. And so I ended up picking that up. And it's been great because then when I invite people to my campaign, everybody can use all of those source materials. So like for example, the um the uh giant one, the um Thunder, what was it? The light storm was the storm oh, giant. Uh, yeah, the gosh, what was that? Storm giant something. <coughs> yeah. Anyways, anyway, yeah. But there was um there were certain classes that were in that uh book that you could only access if you had that book. But now my players could use that to oh. do it. Yeah, and that's have that's like, actually um, kind of nice. Yeah. So there, it's really I mean, nice it's, because it's then, a good system. It's a good it environment. Is. It is a good environment, and again, not everybody has to use. Um, ha has to own the book to be able to then build their character, which um, a lot of other RPGs don't allow, right? So, and D&D &D Beyond does. So, that is kind of nice. I think we've come to a, a conclusion here that for folks who feel burned by this or feel offended by Wizards of the Coast, there's plenty other options in the marketplace. For, for yeah. those folks who, who aren't offended by what your content creator is doing or not doing, and you're sitting on a stack of content and you've got players who love the game, you're going to keep playing the game. So if you're not interested in any of it, this probably is an opportunity to say to yourself, well, if D&D &D is the biggest 900 pound gorilla, what other gorillas are in the zoo? Who else is in the zoo to, to go check out? So I, I, I think... Um, I, I think it may have it may turn off potential new players. I think that's that's probably one of the only long term real negatives because this is a crap ton of bad press. A lot of oh yeah, I I no, I totally agree, and I think um, I think that uh, it the dust will settle and we'll see how this really affects things, right? And, yeah. and it, it's kind of it's kind of weird to say that, but. Um, one of the things that like here on tabletop and beyond, like the three of us, we love playing a lot of different systems. I mean, I'm looking over at my shelf and I've probably got like 10 different systems right there that I like to play. And so it's funny because when I was like, Oh, I'm done with Watsy, I'm I've got to find another thing. And I'm like, find another thing. I've been playing lots of different things. Like, you know, even though we've been playing D and D. And so um, I think we've been preaching, 
to our listeners for a long time that, you know, variety is the spice of life and, you know, understanding different systems makes you a more well-rounded RPG player. So if you want to take a break from WotC, go check out many different things. Check out our friends at Free League Publishing. Check out our friends at Chaosium. You know, you've got Call of Cthulhu. You've got RuneQuest. You've got the One Ring uh, at Free League Publishing. You've got Blade Runner, Alien. Like, there's so many different uh, systems and, and games out there that, you know, don't even come close to using this open gaming license. Like, it's not like you have to go from D&D to Pathfinder. You know what I mean? Like you don't you don't have to yeah. do that. Like yeah. there's so many great things. You could go Shadow of the Demon Lord if you want to and tone it down if you're not used to the MA rating. But yeah, you know, and, and, um, and if you're not writing adventures in your spare time and wanting to publish them on Drive Through RPG, none of this applies to you at all. Right. Exactly. So good good fun topic. I hope the uh the community continues to give us situations that we can discuss. <laughs> That's right. Well That's for right. Th- yeah. Trust me, January is usually no news in gaming land. So this yeah. is yeah. really weird. Well, next topic, uh, art and AI. <laughs> art and AI. Oh, That's yeah, right. There's yeah. a hot button. Actually, I was thinking of getting an artist on here to help us work through that a little bit. It might be interesting to get that. That would be fun. Yeah. So anyway. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for going through this with us. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a like, give us a subscribe. Uh, you know, that helps the algorithm. If you are listening to us on the podcast, be sure to share this with your friends because, you know, we just want to get the, the gaming love out there. So we thank you everyone for for uh, sticking with us and, and being with us as we go through this. So uh, we wish you all a good night and keep the dice rolling. Have fun, everybody. See ya. <laughs>